So everything needs a good foundation. And I got my foundation in life from my mother and she's the one who, um, she had a big heart and she gave me her big heart and she taught us all to live by the golden rule. And she never taught us anything. I mean, never formally. She always led by example. And I think that's important. So remember that. Next. Um, I don't know. I guess from the very beginning, I've always uh, tried to do good with my camera. I started a video production company in 1983. And by 1987, we were doing videos for Habitat for Humanity Charlotte. Both of these are Habitat. 1999 in El Salvador and 2007 with Jimmy Carter Work Project in Los Angeles. Um, I also did a lot of um, free videos for rescue missions and other nonprofits. So, next. So, it was not really a stretch to do good with my camera post stroke, um, just a different um, subject matter. And um, I helped a friend of mine by editing 500 shows. He has a spiritual show, and I edited 500 shows for 10 years. And um, he went from uh, not even having a YouTube channel to, I checked yesterday, he's got 84,000 uh, subscribers. So hopefully I learned something from him. I'm going to have a conference call with him because what we're doing now has been exploding, and I want to take advantage of it. So here we got some post stroke doing good with the camera. We got Jimmy Wayne for Terra All Home for Boys on the left, and then that's me at uh, post stroke at a, one of the um, shoots that we did. And uh, yeah, I can carry my camera and my tripod. Next. So the journey began when I. Uh, had my stroke and was in the rehab hospital. I realized I didn't say anything about my stroke in my intro. So I had a hemorrhagic stroke on the right, left side affected, as you can see. Look at that ankle roll and that posturing arm. But I did walk out of the hospital. That's me walking out of the rehab hospital. Um, it was only the second time I had ever walked post-stroke. So uh, looking down and looking a little nervous, that's why. I don't remember this, but two of my friends said I started talking about, I was talking to them about helping other stroke survivors while I was still in the rehab hospital. I have no recollection of it, but it sounds like me. I don't know what I was going to help them with because uh, I didn't know anything about stroke much. I knew what a stroke was, but uh, I didn't know anything much about it like I do now. So um, next. Um, and I got out and all the resources that I had were back at the rehab hospital and I couldn't call back there like five times a day that, you know, eventually it stopped taking them. So, you know, I felt really alone. And that's a quote from me in 2009 there on the right, the picture is more recent, one of the local stroke survivors I work with, but I basically, they send 800,000 of us a, a year home to reinvent the wheel for ourselves. And being a logical person, I just said, this is stupid. And I thought, well, you got a video camera, you know how to communicate messages. Maybe you should try and do something about this. Yeah, sure. Big problem. Anyhow, so I identified a need based on my own personal experience. Thanks. Um, so I uh, went at it like a maniac, I did about 10 or 12 hours a day, no naps for about 15 months. That's so kind of hard for some stroke survivors to comprehend, but that's what I did. It's my nature. And I got back on my bicycle. I tried it a couple of months. Oh, no, don't. I got up on it after about three minutes and said, how am I going to stop? So anyhow, about 10 months, I took it to the beach in case I fell sand looked better than concrete and uh, I got back on my bike and everybody said wow this is amazing um, when I help people I understand it's about the work and not about me and the reason I have the slide up is because later when we talk about engagement and building communities this is an important thing there's a certain balance between it not being about you and being about you so I had my stroke on my exercise bike so bikes are a big thing to me being a paper boy, uh, starting out in life. And I had my stroke um, 
training for the senior games. So the picture in the top middle is me competing in the senior games a year later. I kind of thought it would be full circle. Well, the newspaper, local newspaper, put it on the front page and everything. I had submitted my photography to them, so they knew who I was and knew what had happened to me and everything, and I had an audience there anyway. So I, I started to notice that the more that the better I did, the more people wanted to talk to me. So I said, okay, it's not about you, but you need to work this. So I threw my bike in the car and I went to the state senior games because in my small town, I was the only one in my age group. And so I won three gold medals and it allowed me to go to the state games where I was the only stroke survivor. And I was, I jokingly say I won my category because there were a bunch of guys there with $6,000 bicycles who rode 500 miles a week and everything. But I was making a point about recovery. And I started talking to a bunch of hospital systems and such. I put together an idea for um, a stroke recovery video or series of videos. And it got pretty extensive. Eventually, I put together a budget. And even my bare bones budget was $300,000. It's really a million dollar project. I started talking to the local hospitals. Everybody said, yeah, we'll help you, but there's no way we could do the whole thing. And um, in the bottom middle is uh, North Carolina Stroke Association. I started with them. I was a letter writer, and I raised a couple thousand dollars in their uh, Cycle for Life event. That's a picture of it there. And eventually, uh, you know, the weather turned cold. I ran out of bike events, and it, I got asked to do some motivational speeches. And that's when I did at Tri-State Stroke Network, where I met Amy Edmonds of Young Stroke. So I, I kind of took the show uh, indoors and to some motivational speeches. Again, I found out the more I talked, the more I did, the more focus I brought to the work I was trying to do. So it's kind of an interesting balance between it's about me, it's not about me. Next. So I happened to sit at the Tri-State Short Network uh, general session next to the only person who lived within uh, 300 miles from me, Amy Edmonds, and she had an advocacy group called Young Stroke. So I got involved with them and uh, for about five or six years, she's now inactive, which is a shame. We put on a seminar. That's what she's talking at in the beginning. I recorded a lot of the sessions, inserted PowerPoint, put them back up on YouTube for stroke survivor and medical personnel continuing education. We did public service announcements. That's one up in the upper right called My Friends about some younger folks who actually had strokes. Those are five stroke survivors. Made it for free in a pizza parlor. And we did things like posters um, and such. And it was really good experience and exposure. I also, I guess I forgot to mention this, uh, North Carolina Stroke decided that I, what I was doing was too big. I couldn't get, get a consortium together. Medical University of South Carolina thought the stroke unit said they would fund half the project if marketing would fund the other. Of course, marketing ended up saying no. Tri-State Stroke Network was all excited about it. They were going to fund the whole thing. And then they're one of five stroke centers that had their budget uh, cut to zero by the CDC that funded them, and all five regional stroke centers uh, disappeared. And so did the hopes of my project. So I started working with Young Stroke, and after a while, actually, Amy said, well, you should do it through our nonprofit. I said, yeah, that's what I've been working for you for for two, three years to hear you say that. And it made it all the way through the board and everything. The board approved it. And then the, they asked the lawyers and accountants. And I got the dreaded, the lawyers say, you could ruin our reputation and we can't do it, call. So I moved on. I'll go ahead to the next slide. Um, while I was doing, working with Young Stroke, I um, was running a stroke survivor support group at the hospital. Uh, I got asked to do it. I didn't know how to do it. But I figured, like everything else in life, I figured it out. So I did, and this is uh, Kelly, who was about the only person who came. No matter what we did, the uh, hospital wouldn't help us. They cited HIPAA. They wouldn't even let us put a brochure or a flyer up in the rehab room. Nothing. So, um, but Kelly came, and she was brought by a, a woman, Kathy, who um, was doing physical therapy with her. And Kathy had some grandchildren born and wanted to... Um, 
go see them and help her daughter out. And so she asked me to fill in on doing physical therapy with Kelly for a couple of weeks while she was gone. I said, sure, but I have no idea what I'm doing. And oh, no worry, Larry, the retired physical therapist will train you. Yeah, he did. He gave me an entire semester on the cranial nerves in 40 minutes, graduate school semester, he said. Hey, I ended up working with Kelly for um, five years. I came home the first uh, after I agreed to do it, and I told my wife, she works hard and everything, but there's no way she's going to walk. And I walked her a thousand feet down the hall about four years later. Um, so uh, just flip through these quick and I'll talk about them. Uh, I got involved in uh, pool therapy, which I am a strong advocate of for um, stroke survivors. Um, uh, I, um, the retired physical therapist hooked me up with uh, Kevin and other people. Suddenly I had, at one point I had five people and it became a, a lot to do because I actually went to their house. What you're seeing is me teaching Kevin how to do sit to stands. And then th those are his very first steps without his cane. Yeah, he's got it in his right hand. And I left him, let him keep it till he was willing to drop it because I didn't want to reintroduce fear into the whole thing because fear works against stroke recovery. Next, and we made, uh, Use of anything and everything we could to keep people moving, as somebody said earlier. Uh, you can only do pool therapy outside in the summer, but that's what we did till we came up with a therapy pool that we could work in. So I got a lot of experience from those uh, local stroke survivors, <coughs> 13 and all. And then I got interested when I was in my re recovery in the early days, there was nothing like the Facebook groups. There were no resources. I looked online and I couldn't even find a single video on stroke recovery, no YouTube channels, nothing like it is today. And anyway, uh, that started to change five, six, seven years ago. And I started noticing support groups. So I joined a couple and then I decided I should, I should start one because I wanted it to take a different, um, um, to tact, and that was the by and for stroke survivors. So a lot of the stuff that um, resources out there for us come from hospital systems and clinicians and, and other things, and they're not really by and, f and therefore not as much for stroke survivors as I had imagined. And so I found it uh, not quite five years ago, and uh, it's 5,500, it's actually 54 or something, but I had changed just in the week that Laura and I have been working on this project. I had to change the number of members three times, so I decided to just go with 5,500 and, and, and leave it at that. Anyhow, we're a collaborative self-management group, but our main thing is that we believe that no one gets better until they take ownership of their recovery. Physical therapists are like piano teachers. They're great to have, but if you don't practice, you don't do well next time when they come around to see how you're doing. We also believe that you get better at home. We believe that you don't get better in one or two 45 minute sessions a week with a physical therapist. We, we know that no one can make us better. We know that we're the only ones that can make ourselves better. So um, I started it with that and um, we're now doing a weekly support group, thanks to Lauren and I, uh, having a conversation six months ago. She was saying, what do you do with uh, Zoom support meetings? And I said, I don't know, I'm paying for Zoom and they just billed me for the second month. You want to start one next Tuesday? And we've done 27 of them. I just finished one earlier this morning with a physical therapist who had a stroke. Interesting perspective. Somebody mentioned the dual perspective earlier in the introductions. And most importantly, we've got a Facebook feed where people are sharing stories and asking questions. And in my group, they are posting videos. I have dragged everybody that I have found, being a video professional myself, I've dragged everybody that I could find who's posting videos of themselves getting better at home into my group. And um, the reason is that I feel that's the most powerful message that a stroke survivor can see and two of those um, people one was being uh, ab abused or underappreciated in another group I dragged him over and he has posted oh probably 1400 videos in the last four years one or two a day 
every day. He quit all his other groups. He's pretty much focused with us. Another one I drove five hours do an interview with, and he's posted one every day. You'll see him a little later in this presentation. So uh, I seeded the group with like 24 people that um, uh, I knew, and um, about five of them dropped out. And <laughs> it took about almost two years to get to 100, and then by two years, we were at 1,000. I don't know if Facebook turned on something or what when we hit 100, but things started to change. It takes a long time to get some synergy going. So remember that if you're trying to build community. Um, I learned some things along the way that I'm gonna try and show you and I would have implemented them earlier, but I didn't know what they were because I'm making this up. I am building the airplane while I'm flying it, as they say. So I got embarrassed um, that I had not done anything with my project, uh, video project, since I had blogged about it and talked to like 15 hospital systems and everybody I could get to listen to me, I started to get embarrassed and I said, well, you've spent 40 years behind the camera. You've, it's a point of pride never to be in front. I, you hate the way you look, but you own a camera, you own an edit system, you had a stroke, you know how you got better, you did better than most people, so you have to point the camera at yourself. So I did. Next. Um, and so slowly started making videos. Uh, I hired a cameraman, uh, a friend of mine, and we've done a four, three or four shoots. We shoot about 15 or 20 videos at a time. I voice them over because as a video professional, having worked with unprofessional talent before, it's hard to ask people to walk, talk, and chew gum at the same time. This way I can perform the action and then I voice them over. And in some cases I realized I forgot something and I went back and shot pickups and made them more complete. And I don't know how that would have happened if I was trying to talk uh, on, on camera at the same time. Uh, the other thing about my videos is if you look at the times, they're, uh, they're all real short, 27 seconds, 35, 135, 107, a minute or so. I don't say, hi, you know, I'm Ralph Preston, it's a wonderful day, I'm having a latte. I, no, they're right, they're completely um, practical. I just show you the exercise, there's no talk, and, you know, you're gone. I try and show you everything that you need to know, and I've tried to, as you'll see coming up, um, since I'm not a physical therapist, I have no education in physical therapy, I am a stroke survivor, I am very observant, and I uh, managed to um, uh, adapt and advise, uh, a lot of things to my own recovery. And now I basically teach them to other people. And so after uh, four or five years, now we've got, I don't know, there's about 20 motivational, about 20 odds and ends, about 80 of these exercise videos. 27th uh, Tuesday meeting was recorded this morning. And now we're starting to generate content. Did, just did an interview with Brian Harris a couple of weeks ago, put up the first clip from that. I've taken a bent towards science and, and neuroscience. I'm going to try and, with Lauren's help, interview a bunch more um, people because I don't see science and uh, being a part of stroke recovery delivery the way it should be. So next. Uh, so we're going to watch a couple to show you basic simple things. This first one's about bolts, and basically I figure out things that other people should be able to but can't, you know. And I live in Groundhog Day, but we'll talk about that in, in a minute. Um, so this is something you bolts are... a couple... No, go ahead, play it. I'll just... I'll of bolts, you. washers, and nuts at your favorite big box home improvement store. I got ones with several inches of thread. Start with the nuts only on the bolts. Screw the nut as far as you can, then unscrew it until it is almost off. Repeat this endlessly. When you get good, unscrew the nut all the way off. Put the washer on, and then screw the nut back on. Expect some frustration at first, as with all of these. Don't use your unaffected hand to stab the washer with the bolt. Instead, slide the washer onto the bolt with your affected hand. 
You want to turn the nut with your affected hand, not the bolt with your unaffected hand. Smaller bolts are harder than larger ones. So that's basically, I've worked with people uh, with bolts, you know, they're a common thing. I'd seen some of the pitfalls. I see people like turning them with the wrong hand and stuff. So I try and address everything that you need to know about bolts, including the size of the bolts, I'm talking about having a lot of threads and stuff. I just try and make everything really simple and easy for people because that's the way that they're most, most likely to follow it. One thing that I do, uh, do have is pretty good body awareness and I noodle around with stuff. That's a set of parallel, um, I'm, well, I'm going to mention that. I, I, I cut this down, it's still kind of long. Uh, I cut out the part where I actually put sandbags on that walker so somebody could, uh, with a taxi, that couldn't lift it off the ground. Um, but one thing that I do is I'm good at adapting stuff. I'm good at breaking things down, which is often important. Uh, people look at something as a big problem and they don't see it as pieces, that they could solve the pieces of the problem and then put all the pieces together and have a solution to the big problem. I'm pretty good at that. I see problems as opportunities to create solutions, not as uh, stone walls. So go ahead and play that. I, uh, you can play it, Lori. Um, and they teach foot placement at physical therapy. Here, I'm using a walker to simulate parallel bars and a 4x4 instead of a $100 maple therapy box. Foot placement is very important. You want to learn to control your foot and put it in the same place every time. You want to be able to do this without looking. You didn't look pre-stroke. This is called proprioception. The definition is perception or awareness of the position and movement of the body. In our case, that would be knowing where your foot is without looking. One stroke survivor I worked with kicked the block. I felt bad for her. So I tried tape on the floor and found it works fine. This is another one they teach you at physical therapy. This time you step over the block. As you get better, you can add that little lunge your leg and hip do right after your foot lands. The tape works fine for step overs too. Watch what happens as I try these no hands. You might be able to use this trick in your recovery. As you can see, I don't do very well. But I try three more holding on lightly, paying strict attention to the movement, and patterning my brain. It's obvious that it worked if you watch the next four. I do this with just about anything I'm having trouble with. So try patterning your brain. So I know I'd never had anybody talk to me. You can flip to the next one, Lauren. I never had anybody talk to me about patterning or anything. I didn't invent it. Um, but um, I, it's a practical thing that as a stroke survivor and not a physical therapist that I can bring to the whole party. I never had a, a physical therapist talk to me about patterning, bi bilateral patterning, light touching, any of the things that uh, I sort of semi-discovered. So one of the things we've been doing now is making up playlists. I've got 12 videos on things I did to get my hand back. So they're playlists now. It needs a description. Um, actually, what I'm going to do is make videos on all of these on how to use the, the videos and uh, where to start at different places. Uh, one thing leads to another with this stuff. Go ahead, next. Uh, and there's one for walking better. This one really needs uh, um, a, a, a video on you know getting rid of drop foot, ankles. Um, I actually have a playlist on ankles as well and one on shoulders. Anyway, um, so as we've gotten more videos, I've tried to learn about YouTube and refine the thing to make it easier for people. I got this basic theory, if you don't make it easy for people, they aren't going to do it. 
And if I'm in the business of trying to get them to do stuff and look at things differently, then I should be making it easy for them. Go ahead, next. Oh, Lauren picked this, and I'm happy to read this. Um, basically, uh, I found out that there are a lot of people out there that are hungry for this stuff, and they use it, and it makes a difference, and that makes me happy. Next. Uh, okay. Yeah, well, this one got left in. I mean, it, it, it's not b bad, but... So Laura and I were having conversations. She asked me if I'd talk to her about Facebook, and I said, sure, but you're going to get 10 earfuls. After an hour and 45 minutes when we were hanging up, I said, well, that was 20 earfuls. And I was thinking to myself, oh, my God, I didn't warn her about me. There's no way she's going to ever want to talk to me again. And she said, that was great. When can we do it again? I went, holy cow. Um, anyway, we had the conversation I mentioned earlier about um, – zoom and i was paying for it so i think it was the very next tuesday we just said okay we'll start zoom meetings um i'd led some uh a stroke survivor support group before so i wasn't you know in complete um new territory but um i quickly found that i don't like the chit chat i never did like the chit chat groups just like i don't like the personality videos where you have to listen to them about what they're having for breakfast for five minutes before you get to the exercise. So we quickly turned it towards um, subjects as opposed to random conversations. And we started having presenters. We did presenters from within the stroke community, our, our little stroke group. We ran out of them pretty quick and subject matter because we're stroke survivors and not necessarily, ex necessarily experts. So I started looking towards experts. And when I did, I found some, uh, well, we've had on so far, we've had uh, two OTs, a PT today, and a neuroscientist who all had strokes. Well, every one of them has got a completely different outlook on stroke. Mitchell, the PT this morning, was talking about how he used things from his recovery with his patients, including uh, the concept of play. Sherry, who had a, is an occupational therapist who had a stroke, um, said it completely changed her practice. Dr. Hetzler, Bruce, I should call him Dr. Hetzler, um, is a neuroscientist. He's appeared four times, and he's educated us on neuroplasticity, spasticity, stroke in the brain, and language in the brain. And uh, so we've definitely taken a turn towards science, and uh, we had Cyan from uh, MedRooms on... Uh, uh, music therapy, Dr. Carolyn Falkner, aphasia expert, back to Bruce because he bridges lots of things. He did the interview with Brian. We're talking about having Lou Awad and uh, Mag uh, Selim um, appear. And uh, we're talking to a lot of people in the background, Botox experts, other PTs and OTs that haven't had strokes. Yeah, I heard a report on General Michael Hayden having a stroke, and I said, hey, Actually, my brother-in-law told him about it. Let's give credit where credit's due. I said, I'll write to him. And I did. And guess what? He said yes. So he's going to be on the show. Lesson there. You get nothing of what you don't try for. Some A lot of people would have said, hmm, he's a big deal. He used to run the CIA. He's not going to want to appear on a rinky-dink Tuesday show. Well, he did because of the way I approached him, the way I wrote a letter to him. Next. I'm trying to get through all this in, you know, reasonable time. That's why I'm going fast. Uh, Ralph, um, don't, don't worry about, don't worry about the timing. Seriously. Lauren, we, we, we're going to amend the agenda a bit. You've heard me talk for an hour and 45 minutes straight. So be careful what you wish for. Anyway, <laughs> so we've, you know, expanded the playlist things. There's, um, you know, a good, uh, what we're doing now is we see things like diet's a big deal. What diet should I be on? Everybody wants to follow somebody else. They don't want to figure out anything for yourself, for themselves. The problem is that every stroke is different, every recovery is different, every person is different. They've got different tastes in food and stuff. So we see issues like, you know, they get brought up a lot, like, uh, oh, will I ever drive again? Or how long it take you guys to drive? Did anybody fly in an airplane? What food should I be eating? So we do things like the best diet for you post-stroke. And we talk about just like um, being your own best patient advocate and becoming your own physical therapist. 
is something you have to figure out for um, yourself. Anyway, we're trying to pack a lot of science in there. William Lowe down there in 23, he's a stroke survivor at uh, age 17, went on to become an occupational therapist, and that's a talk about how your, uh, your uh, brain creates a blueprint and how your, uh, how, how your memory works. How, you, how your brain makes movement blueprints and how you can use them to help in your recovery. Next, um, this is a video clip from Dr. Hetzler, just an example of science. You want to click on that, Lauren? Now, some spontaneous recovery does occur after a stroke, but it doesn't last forever. Spontaneous motor recovery only occurs during the first six months of recovery. And doctors today may still tell you that after six months, that's as good as you're going to get because that's what they learned in medical school. We now know that is not correct. And rehabilitation, basically work on your part, can allow you to make further progress. Next. So that was the all important. Um, you can Some get better spontaneous recovery. Nope, to repeat. So um, another one Lauren picked. I sent her about 30 of these. It's unbelievable how, what's happening now in terms of people thanking us and recognizing what we're doing. I'm going to try and take advantage of that and see if we can ride this wave. Anyway, um, this was a presentation on being your best patient advocate, getting your hospital records. You know, if you, if you tell people like what the issues are. This is from a presentation I did called What Happened, What to Do About It. So you can't just tell people what happened and, you know, you need to, like, have all your records. You need to give them um, uh, an action plan. So we do, and people like that. We got a great one to this morning. Uh, can't be in this presentation because it just got written uh, a couple of hours ago about the meeting this morning. Anyway, flip. Um Another thing that we do is uh, in the group feed is, like I mentioned, we have, um, I drag everybody I can find who's posting videos. There are more videos of people getting better um, in Stroke Buddies than anywhere. We also do challenges, like in the middle is uh, 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 three weeks, uh, the first walk um, on the right uh, three weeks earlier than the follow-up walk on the left. And you can actually see her walking better. Um, this is Rebecca, who is an admin in the group, and she's helping a lot with everything that we're trying to do to expand it. No, it's not rigged because you can actually watch her doing that. And I coached her and gave her some tips, even though I'm probably, I'm not licensed to do that. See, what happens is everybody runs out of stroke, out of insurance. And there are a number of people, me included, that want to get better after their insurance is gone. So you have to learn to be your own physical therapist. And so I have, and I find that people really like um, getting pointers. They don't seem to realize what they're doing. It's pretty obvious. Uh, the one on the left is a challenge we did in another group that I brought to Stroke Buddies. I liked the idea. And the one on the right is a woman who joined the group, and within a week, she posted that my videos were helping her walk better, and she posted a video of it. I'd never, I'd only, I remember letting her in because I remember it was only a week. How cool is that? And that's a really good example. It's not so much as she's driving people to my way of doing things. My way of doing things, I basically stole from every physical therapist in our article I ever read, Dr. Tara Tobias, anybody and everybody out there. Uh, and when people have a physical therapist, I say, this is what I would tell you to do, but go to your physical therapist and do me a favor and come back and tell me what they say. And they almost always say, um, yeah, what he said was right. Or, or, you you know, go ahead and do that. And that's good for me because I want to make sure I'm giving out good advice, especially since I'm not licensed in, or educated in any way. So next um, I left this one out uh, for a sec because this one's the most important to me, and it's the last couple of sentences. We celebrated 5,000 people. She's been with us as Deb and Mark Taladeek, and, and yeah, I know a lot of these people. I coach her. 
if she's been with the group since 500, she, in our almost five years, she's been with us a better part of, so three and a half at least, three for sure. And the last sentence is, is what um, I like. I still have work to do. Stroke Buddies has been a guiding light during times when main street ther mainstream therapy has fallen short. Well, I'm not here to knock mainstream therapy, but it's a, a machine driven by the insurance companies and, the, and stroke survivors get zero education in how to deal with it. And therefore, they don't take advantage of it the way they should. We have this whole thing about how to get the most out of your physical therapist by asking for homework and doing the homework <laughs> and impressing them. And then you'll have a completely different relationship. So we try and change all the paradigms. But that means a lot to me that there are people out there that look to me and the other people in the group. Uh, and the guiding light can sometimes be what's going on up top there. You know, for once I woke up feeling like myself. Sorry, I have a hard time with some of this. Um, next. Uh, and I don't know where they come from. We're just going to flip through these as fast as I can read Botswana. Singapore, India, Mexico, India, Malawi, Africa. This is my, these are feeds from my um, messenger. Uh, I have about 400 of them. I found nine foreign countries in about 10 minutes. I think some of these would make great stories. People like Christopher uh, Nace has, he sent me close to 100 videos over the last two years and they show his progress. And the things that we're talking about show all the issues. I don't have enough time. I need about four of me, not just two, but I'd love to go back and, and uh, some of these stories. Oh, my formatting's off. That South Africa is supposed to be on the other slide. England, South Africa. Okay, so that's it about what we've been doing. And now I've thought, um, well, Lauren just asked me to talk about what we've been doing. And then um, she sent me a template that basically talked about building community. So I decided that I was really make a presentation on how to build community. And I thought, well, I don't know anything about that. And then I thought as I started putting it together, yes, you do. You've been involved in this and you, and you know a lot of um, stuff, whether you think you know it or not. It's a lot like not being educated. You know, you think you're not, don't know anything about stroke because you don't have a degree. Well, I was saying that to one of my friends one time and they looked at me funny, incredulously. It cocked their head and said, but you have the ultimate degree, meaning I had a stroke and I got better from it. Okay, so the first thing about, we'll go ahead back for a sec. The first thing about, um, nope, back, okay. Um, there's the old line, if you build it, they will come. And I've found this is to be true. However, there are a couple of caveats. No one joins a group or a community unless they want something. And in this case, it's information. They might want to chit chat and read the memes and make friends and stuff, but they're really all there for information. So if you want to build a community, I would suggest you go after information right away. Just like I tell every stroke survivor in that what happened, what to do about it. The first thing you need to do is learn everything you can about the brain. Learn everything you can about being a physical therapist. Be your own patient advocate. Anyway, if you get the get them the information that they need, they that um, they will come. Um, the other thing is, there has to there has to be you have to make them feel like they're a part of something. I skipped that in the young stroke. I had a note to say that when I was uh, working with the young stroke, it was the first time I felt like a part of a community. I felt like I was doing something. It was part of a movement. And so that's what I'm reiterating here, although I forgot to mention it 15 slides ago. The other thing I would say is that, um, you know, people are going, where are you going to find another Ralph Preston that's going to answer all these messages, make all these videos, and do all this stuff? Well, you may not be able to, but you, no matter who you find, every um, community needs a champion. And... Um, that champions who need some help. I'm trying to build this community to 100,000 and then a million. That's, those are ridiculous numbers on it when you hear them, but it may be possible. We'll see. Anyhow, in order to scale this, I think Medrun's found a little bit out about trying to scale human interaction into technology with Mr. Bryant trying to um, figure out how to go from strumming a guitar backwards on the 
at the Spalding Clinic to um, the current product. So I would say think about scaling early, build a team, start early, because right now I'm in a situation where things are exploding. And in order to build a team, it takes away from my time. It's just like computer software. There's beauty when it works, but there's pain getting it going. So start early. Next. Uh, this is my participation. I just thought it was interesting. Yeah, let's see, what did I have? Uh, 1,100 comments in a 90-day period, uh, 81 posts. So I'm posting sometimes four times a day, generally averaging at least one. I try and make all my posts informative. We allow memes and stuff, but nobody posts them because everybody's there for information. We're going to get to that on the next slide, but before we go there, uh, analytics is important. I would... Um, suggest if you are serious about what you're trying to do um, that you look at analytics. I got discouraged one time and one of my mentors, I have two mentors on my work, I take it seriously, I consider it work, I do work 60 to 80 hours a week or this week 100. Anyway, um, one of them, I was saying, oh, I don't know if what I'm doing is doing any good. He said, let's look at the numbers. Okay, you got 80 new members this month. That's good. You got this, you got that. And he said, let's look at engagement. And I said, I got like 4,000 people at the time. And like 40 of them are active. It's discouraging. Well, he calls it up and he finds out that we have 1,400 people a day coming to the group at that point. 1,400. I would have told you it was 240 were active. So it made me aware of lurkers. There are a lot of lurkers out there. So whatever you're doing, you have to remember that there are, for everybody that makes a comment, there are 20 people that don't make, or 100 people that don't make a comment or don't give you a like or whatever. And I don't believe in all that Facebook like stuff. I like stuff and love stuff in the group to show support and to show um, owner, active owner involvement. Uh, next. And this is what, this is a really important thing. Like when I talk about giving them information, uh, it's important that if somebody comes to your page or your community that they find two things. One, what they're looking for, that's the information. But it's also important to, uh, I feel, to have, a, a have and maintain a positive culture because people will align themselves with the culture that they are around. And I'll take that one step further people will seek out cultures that suit their worldview. And I believe that most people want to be around positive people. Most people are positive. The people who have had a stroke or are having a pity party, it, it can be temporary and you can uh, slap them and help them. And, and uh, we do that in Stroke Buddies, but that's an hour long presentation just on the methodology that we use. We've got, we won't kick anybody out of the group. We have bad behavior just like everywhere else, but we're working on a plan to do something about it. Anyway, having what people see, first impressions are important. So you don't want a lot of negativity. You want a lot of uh, positivity. Other members see, we have over a thousand new members in the last six weeks because we've been recruiting rather successfully, which proves to me that the other groups and the physical therapists and everybody out there are not doing their job in supplying information because we couldn't pull a thousand people over in six weeks if they were happy in the groups that they were in. They don't leave the other groups. I wish other group owners would realize that if you promote your group, you're not taking anybody away from them. They're joining another group. I'm a member of 20. Anyway, uh, what's happened here with us recently, we have all these new members. Well, it's real important to have good stuff for them because they're coming in and getting that first impression. Well, what's happened is they see other people helping. We have people, I don't even know their names. I'm not even, I have an ad, uh, Rebecca's admining, so I didn't even let them in. And all of a sudden we got people posting videos. I've never seen them before. We got people helping. And not only that, we got the people who were helping a little bit go, Wait a minute, now all these new members are helping. I've been here a long time. I need to up my game. And we've got about, I can name them. Uh, 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 I won't because I'll leave some people out and that'll make them feel bad. But we have a half a dozen people that I can name that were helping people. But when other people started helping people, they upped their game. It's a kind of like the rising tide floats all boats as opposed to the insurance model, which is trickle down. And I won't talk about what's trickling down. Um, 
So we do recruit members. And the way that you keep people in a community and the way that you get them to be involved is through engagement. And it's very important to have and very important to maintain. And how do you do that? Well, I don't know. I've picked on, uh, no, it's okay. I picked on uh, creative creativity and having some concepts. I never post anything without a picture or a video. I don't think the text posts draw enough attention. You can see the paragraphs that are associated with these. I also give complete explanations. I know there are people that can't process all this. I know there are stroke survivors that are overwhelmed, but there are others who aren't. And it's just my way of doing a complete job, doing the best I can, putting it out there and hoping people are going to get it. And so these are a couple of challenges that we did, uh, you know, um, to get people to one's the walking challenge. The other one's like, I'm showing something that actually nobody can do, but she wanted me to do that. I used to not show this kind of stuff because I thought it was bragging, but um, people have told me it's inspirational, so I changed my mind about it. We're talking in that case about what can you do now that you couldn't do. It's a it's a gratitude thing. It's an acknowledging where you were and where you are kind of thing, and uh, that's important to uh, the mental aspect of recovery is um, overlooked. And we have a person, Jenny Golder, who has taken this on. It was. Uh, she feels strongly about it. She's an 18 year survivor. She went through it herself. Her brother committed suicide two years ago. It's very near and dear to her heart and she does a wonderful job with it. We think that um, mental is maybe even more important because guess what? If you're sitting in the corner having a pity party, you aren't going to get out and do your exercises. So it's maybe more important. Next. Next slide. Okay. Um, I also believe in branding, okay? Now, you know, things change, like Brian uh, Harris came up with the more advocacy saying. I liked it, so I added it to the logo. But when you see this blue thing in the groups, everybody knows what it is. They know it's an announcement to our Tuesday thing because I keep them consistent. And I insist on, like, having some pictures. And it's like everything. I'm a big believer in quality everything because people judge you on everything even the smallest things. And if you want them to put credibility in you and your information, then you need to do everything um, first rate. And back to leading by example with my mother, I can inject it at any point. I'm gonna do it right now because I remember it. Here's the thing, people don't judge you by your words. They don't believe your words. People judge you by your actions. Now, if you've been in my group for a while and you've seen what I do, after a while, you can, you'll can you believe my words because you go, this guy's a maniac and he backs everything up. So you get some credibility there, but your credibility comes really from what you do, not what you say. Anyhow, branding is important. Lauren will tell you that. And next... Um, I'm a big believer in imagery. We were doing something on left side of neglect, and I remembered that um, uh, one of my local stroke survivors who likes butterflies like I do, I photograph them, drew me a butterfly of hope, broke my heart. But anyway, I thought it's perfect because she has minor left side neglect. You can see it right there. What's better than something that's completely realistic? And Who's going to put the text on the left side? I guess you could put it over there and everybody who doesn't answer would be having left side neglect, except it's hard to count people who don't answer. Uh, bad joke. All right, next. Uh, we also make issues about attitude and we try and educate people. I make, uh, I make my own memes. They're not memes. Uh, this is a big issue. A lot of people think if you uh, accept what's happened to you that you're quitting. That's a biggie because you're not quitting. You can accept what happened to you and decide to be the best new you you can be, and they're completely compatible. So this also gets people involved, engaged, because engagement is all about keeping them there. And if you keep people around, they interact with other people, and you have community. Um, if people come and go, you don't have near as much community. Next. And of course, we have fun. This is a famous Yogi Berra quote. All I did was change baseball to stroke recovery. He's famous for his uh, yogiisms that don't make sense. Of course, that's 140%. Um, and so we try and have fun. Uh, 
we have a pick of the day. I started posting my photography and all of a sudden people are, are clamoring for my photography. And I think, well, it's a waste of my time. And I say, no, you enjoy doing it, Ralph. People like your photography. And then somebody said the clincher. She said, I come every day to look at your pictures. I'm going to have a hard time with this, sorry. Because I can't get outside to see the sky. Well, that breaks my heart. And so I started, I looked for sky pictures and started tagging her. Don't think everybody else didn't see what was going on. We also have music of the day. Well, we have a challenge. Post what you're doing, uh, listening to. We try and keep it upbeat or something that you can dance to or move to or exercise to. Involvement again. Tying it back to stroke. Tying it back to our commonality, not our differences. We celebrate our commonality. I have no rules in the group. I don't believe in rules. If you have rules, people will break them because people like to break rules. So we don't have any. We treat people like adults. They generally act like adults, just like your kid. I raised my daughter. I taught her, treated her like a little adult. She behaved like a little adult, pretty much. I mean, she was a kid too. But, you know, you give people respect, uh, they'll respect you. So no rules. We deal with the problems that we have on an individualized basis, and we try and have fun, keep it light, without 437 uh, memes that say the same thing. We also try and communicate back. We try and let people know that their opinion is important, and that it will steer the ship in the direction that they want it to go. And again, you know, so I take a picture that I've never used for pool therapy before, and I just stick it over, because people go, what's that? and you've got them engaged. So those are some tricks that I've used to um, get engagement. And when you have engagement, what happens is people start telling other stroke survivors. Remember, they're all members of 10 groups or or, or more. So I answered, what, I, uh, it was 1,100 comments. Those aren't like good job or anything. Those are like paragraphs. And so I got tired. I realized I lived in Groundhog Day about three years ago. And I said, one day I said, I just wrote something on this yesterday. Let me go find it because that was really good. And I hate Facebook because you can't find anything even that you posted. I got better at it since then. But so I started a word doc. And I believe that I, I know I shared it with Laura and I believe that she shared it with some of the Eversana people. And I go to this, I can always personalize it. But if somebody's, uh, you know, got PBA, and they don't even know what PBA is, there's a paragraph with four links. And it's personal. I had it, it went away. That's what they want to hear. It went away. I had it, I didn't do anything, it went away. Anyway, it's not always the case. But these are some examples of that 50-page uh, document. Gabapentin, pre uh, preventing another stroke, neurofatigue. You know, I've had to write on everything. Next. And one thing we're doing now is they're taking frequently asked questions. This is on turmeric. So, you know, typically we would answer that. And uh, I was thinking about, you know, on the new website, having a frequently asked questions page. And um, <clears throat> so we've taken it one step farther. And on the right, we're doing like research on this stuff. We're not going to just have it be, you know, our, our answers. We're going back to the science. I need to step this up and get through this, so we're almost done. Uh, this is something, okay, so when you have engagement, this is something that just happened, and uh, if we want to, we can play the video. If not, uh, we're getting near the end. So this is another guy. This is a guy, Neil Isaacs. I drove five hours to interview him, and I found out that he had the, basically the same kind of philosophy I did. I kind of knew that from uh, texting with him, but I wasn't sure. I'm always looking for other voices to say the same thing I am. I'm mean, not to say my words, but other people who feel the same way. So that, because in the early days, I felt like it was just me. You know, I'm the only voice. So Neil became another voice for us. And this man, uh, and uh, he's coming up. I met him three years ago. January will be three years. So about uh, 21 months ago. And in that time, he has posted a video every single day in my group. And he gets off on it because he's got a following, a following with inside the group. On the left, it's not a video, it's a screen grab. When we hit 5,200, we hit 5,000 and we were growing so fast, it was 52 by the time I could get a post out. 
So he he played his uh, flugelhorn, and what did he play? He played the Impos Dream, the Impossible Dream from Man of La Mancha, totally appropriate, dedicated to the group. So then over the weekend, this last weekend, as in two days ago, we discovered a service that allowed us to transcribe our videos. And we've run about 70 videos through there. Just ask Lauren, because I sent her eight of them this morning on some med rhythm talks. So Rebecca uh, used this quote from Brian, from my interview with Brian. And she pulled it out of the transcript, posted it. Neil saw it. He stole it, put it on his personal page. I saw it on his personal page. Didn't know uh, it came from Rebecca at that point. Went back to her and said, wow, that must have come from you. Oh, yeah, it did. We ought to, and she said, we ought to get him to play his flugelhorn and, 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 you know, make a big deal of it. I said, well, ask him. I'm too busy with this PowerPoint. So she did. And he sent me a video. I didn't even get to look at it for a couple of hours. But guess what? He made us a custom video for this presentation. So, Lauren, if you'd play that, it's pretty short. He's got, uh, this is 76. For my ischemic bones. stroke and brain bleed, I could not move this hand at all. It was frozen. But over the years, uh, this is my fourth year coming up in November from having my stroke. I've been using music and my flugelhorn. And I want to show you how with using music, my finger movement has improved. This is 76 trombones from The Music Man by Meredith Wilson, 1957. See, I know the significance of that because he's been, it's a very difficult piece and he's, it's the fifth time that he's recorded it that I know of and it keeps getting better. Zoom chopped it up a little bit. Anyway, so what's in the future so we can get this, uh, get Lauren's meeting back on track? Well, we're in the process of registering as a 501c3. South Carolina has approved us as a nonprofit, and so is the IRS, but they haven't given us the nonprofit tax status yet, so we're waiting on that. We're about to do a big website launch because I want to be bigger than Facebook group. And we have somebody of, of former stroke survivor, Art Jensen, who developed a great site and then took a job, went back to work. His old boss called him up and said, I need you. He said, I'm in a wheelchair. The guy said, I'll hire you a driver. I don't care. I need you. He went back to work. He doesn't want to see all this work die. So he's going to give us a hundred page website to launch with stroke site, uh, but it's going to become stroke buddies. And yeah, the impossible dream, speaking of impossible dreams, uh, I'm a big believer in numbers because I don't think we have a voice. And part of the reason we don't have a voice is we're individual voices. I believe that not, there's power in numbers. And if we can get to uh, bigger numbers, then we're going to have a bigger voice. And that's going to allow us to affect um, recovery. That's ultimately what I'd like to do. I'd like to have a fundamental uh, effect on the way stroke recovery is delivered. Yep, that's a bold goal. We want to take it outside the Stroke Buddies uh, Facebook community. We want to, these are kind of long-term things. We want to end up funding stuff ourselves because we know what's important. Uh, we want to work with academic and corporate partners. We want to be able to hold fund rate. We want people to be able to give us money. Um, next. So the reason for 501c3 is you can have partners and people can give you donations and they're tax deductible. They also allow you to apply for grants, work with foundations. We could fund research of our own. We could um, generate continuing education and affect that uh, stroke recovery delivery system. And we could out have outreach uh, internationally, nationally, whatever, whatever. There's a lot of need out there. Next. So we're uh, going to launch strokebuddies.org. We have several qualified volunteers. You'd be surprised at what stroke survivors can do. Right, Lauren? <laughs> and uh, so uh, 
we're going to get stroke site. It's a WordPress thing. Art doesn't believe that WordPress has a future, and he's uh, turning us on to some alternative community sites that he has um, uh, been exploring. I'm open to that because this is one smart man, and I agree with him on a number of things. So uh, that's something I don't know enough about to talk about, but I will be, and I will be sharing it with you, Lauren, uh, because it might be something that you know you might want a uh, direction you might want to take. I don't see them as mutually exclusive. The website is going to, uh, you can use Facebook to fuel, uh, to feed the website or the alternative communities. It all can be one big happy party. Okay. We're almost done here. So I'm a big believer in partnerships. It says down there on the bottom, everybody's an ally. I've tried to reach out to somebody doing the same kind of work I am. And somebody said to me, oh, they were not going to talk to you. They'll see you as competition. I said, I don't see anybody as competition. That's crazy. We're all trying to achieve the same goal, help people. So foundations, hospital systems, teaching hospitals, universities may all well be in our future. I don't know. We're building the airplane while we're flying it. Next. Uh, I, I do have a connection with MUSC, Medical University of South Carolina Stroke Recovery Research Center. I actually run a, another stroke group with 10,000 people. So between the two groups, I've got over 15,000 now. And uh, NIH funds the Stroke Recovery Research Center. It's the only one like it in the country. I've already been doing videos and still photography for them for free. That's what you're seeing here. I have a relationship with Dr. Couch, the director. And I want to um, uh, explore that more. And very, very, very quickly, what if we funded research on spasticity or something? Uh, and let's assume for the moment that it was uh, within MedRhythm's um, purview or expertise. And then you got MUSC. So we could fund research that we think is important to stroke survivors. We could get to MedRhythm's or another company like that to put together the science behind it and uh, generate um, a product or a study. And then we could get uh, the medical university or someone like it. They do triple blind studies. That's what they're doing there. Uh, the woman in the middle is actually, I know she's a control because guess what? She's the mother of the guy of the kid on the right who had a stroke at 18. So they do triple blind stuff. So I could see this whole thing, this whole progression from funding research that we don't feel is being funded right now to um, all the way to validating it. Next. Um, this is real, I'll be real quick with this. This is a comment we got on the uh, last week's language thing. And the point of this is, um, uh, not thank you, Ralph, I'm learning about my deficits. Oh yeah, I have aphasia and I apply neuroplasticity and science in my personal recovery. Um, I don't think anybody thinks we're a bunch of dummies, but there are, we're, uh, there's a lot of us out there that have identified the same gap that I have. In the beginning, it was like totally to resources. Now the gap seems to be that the quality of the resources that we get don't reflect enough science to us. And the point of this is there are a lot of people out there that understand neuroplasticity and are hungry for this, so we're going to try and continue to bring science to them. Next. And the reason for that is, um, I don't think, and the reason for having 100,000 or a million people is, I don't think we have a voice. And we're not going to change anything until we get a seat at the table. So um, that's uh, an ultimate goal. That's the reason for the numbers. Uh, if, um, and uh, one follow-up to the whole thing would be, uh, okay, you're looking at 12 people there. 11 of them had strokes. Can you pick out the one who didn't? No, you can't. Do you know, there's Mitch up there. I'm pointing at my screen. I can't do that. Um, Mitch is the uh, third one from the left on the top. He presented this morning. He's an expert in proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. So there's no reason why, us as, why we, as stroke survivors, can't generate the content that we want to see in, uh, delivered to us in our recovery. I've been to a neurodevelopment trained physical therapist. Yes, she started with the brain. It was a much better approach than the ortho ones who start with the body part and don't ever get to the brain. 
but there's no reason there, there, I never heard the word neuroplasticity. I never got taught any real science. All of the, I ask a million questions. I'm annoying as hell, but I have to understand all this in order to want to do it for myself and want to do it for you. So there's no reason that that group of people there can't develop continuing education. One other thing that we want to do in order to bring more science to people is to, well, we just did an interview with Brian, but I'm hoping there's going to be a follow-up. I'd really like to talk to him more about um, neuroplasticity and, and uh, getting back to natural and some of the things that concern stroke survivors more. The first interview we did, I thought it would be important to tell how we went from a young drummer to a clinician to a CEO, because I found that story kind of fascinating. And in a long conversation, it kind of has to be a story. Interview can be different. So the, um, Lauren suggested uh, uh, Lou next, and I'd like to march down the whole line of uh, Medrhythm's neuroscientists and interview every last one of them. Uh, we're going to close with a little clip uh, with the interview with Brian and my apologies. I talked as fast as I could. I skipped over a thousand things. I could have talked 200 minutes instead of 40 or whatever I took. I'm sorry, Lauren. And here's the sample of the recent interview with Brian. Would you mind spending a minute or so talking about how um, music opens up pathways in the brain? Yeah, I would love to, Ralph. This is a, a great topic, one of my favorite topics to talk about, in fact. Um, and so when we think about the human brain just in general, you know, there are parts of your brain uh, that control each aspect of our bodies and the way that we think and the way that we move and the way that we speak and the way that we talk. It's a very complex network of systems in our brain that control everything about our body. And what the research has shown is that when we as humans listen to music that we like. It engages the parts of our brain that are responsible for movement, language, attention, memory, emotion, executive function. So really this global engagement. And when we think about engagement, what, what I actually mean is an activation. So if you were able to essentially look at a heat map of your brain, your, these different parts of your brain would be activated while you're passively listening to music. And there's no other stimulus on earth that engages our brain like music does in this way. 